A dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. Now, it's not very often I'll quote Yoko Ono in my introductions, but that does seem particularly apt for today's story. What is a dream? How does it help us unlock the secrets to our lives? What things can we only work out in the realm of the unconscious? All these are questions posed by today's story, another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault. We are truly blessed at the moment with some of the wonderful stories that are being shared exclusively with me so I can read them to you. Well, my dear friends, it's Monday. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Tonight, I've been struck with a rare moment of clarity. I'm currently sitting by the window staring out into a perfect night sky. With a moon so magnificent, it shines up my clustered little apartment. One filled with artifacts and mementos of a life lived, but since forgotten. There's a tumour inside my head, growing larger for each passing day, gradually stealing away my memories and bodily functions. It has been there for at least a year, and I'm not sure how many days or weeks I have left. I can feel myself quickly fading away for good. I can't be sure how many times they told me my diagnosis. Not that I was ever in denial about my disease. Apparently, I was quite accepting from the start. But the whole month surrounding the tests and diagnosis is stripped from my memory, alongside large chunks of life. All I remember is a car going off the road. I was driving and somehow missed the turn. The doctor tells me I suffered a seizure due to the tumour, and he kept reassuring me that it wasn't my fault. Not that it matters anyway. It's only a car, and I can't drive under my current circumstances. I was injured in the wreck. Nothing too serious, but enough to warrant a scan to see the extent of the damage. Internal bleeding is a bitch. And that's when they accidentally discovered the little bundle of cancer feeding off my brain. My memory started fading, being eaten up day by day. To me, that was always worse than dying, losing the essence of myself while my body surrenders to cancer, but still being aware enough to realize how much I've lost. Whatever the case may be, for tonight, I can remember who I am. I fully intend to share as much as possible before I fade away once more. My disease started out fairly innocent. A headache here and there. Some disturbed sleep without any dreams. I thought it was sort of odd, considering I'd always been an avid dreamer, even keeping a dream journal for several years. Then the headaches increased in intensity and frequency. Turning from a small dull pain to an unrelenting pounding on the side of my skull, feeling as if my head could crack at any moment. None of that matters, however. I've come to terms with my fate, and require absolutely no pity. I know there's nothing I could have done. First thing to say is that my doc is a great man. For forty years he's dealt with patients at the end of their journey in life, and despite this, he keeps his spirit up and manages to somehow bring a bit of light to a dark path. Of course, it helps that he willingly prescribes all the good stuff that takes the pain away temporarily. I took some painkillers he'd given me, alongside a couple of sleeping pills. Maybe a few more than I should have, but I figured I had nothing left to lose. No job or anything to wake up for. No sooner had my head hit the pillow than I was out. For the first few minutes, it felt like I was floating in space. There were no stars or planets, just a comfortable dark void that left me floating with my own thoughts. No pain or memories of past ache, only peace. I briefly considered the possibility that I died in my sleep, but even that didn't bother me. My blissful swim in the void was suddenly interrupted by a bright light, invading the darkness, and once again, I was a man with a physical body. I woke up, and at that moment all my memories had been stripped from me, and naked personality was all that remained. I was outside, lying on the ground. 
Above me was a perfectly blue sky, the sun neither rising nor setting, but I guessed it would have to be around noon either way. It took a while for reality to set in. I was dressed, except for my feet, still bare but clean. Around me were tall blades of grass. I'd been sleeping in an unkept field. Eventually, I forced myself to stand up. I was not in any pain. In fact, my body felt healthy. I scanned my surroundings. It was completely devoid of any visible life, only grass reaching out for miles as far as I could see. Empty horizons in each direction. There were birds chirping somewhere in the fields, although I couldn't quite figure out where the sound came from. The grass gently waved in the wind. It was a surreal, perfect environment, and yet I felt a bit uneasy. I reached the horizon a couple of times before I realized that the chirping didn't really come from any particular direction, and that the grass moved even though there was no wind to feel. No sooner had I noticed this oddity, before everything fell dead silent, and I saw something in the distance. A forest had appeared just about a mile ahead, with trees standing tall in an endless ocean of vegetation, reaching impossibly far beyond the horizon. It was a magnificent sight, and I instantly knew that's where I had to go. Despite the forest being far away, I only walked for a couple of minutes before I stood by the tree line. I wondered if I'd zoned out, but it was all too quick. I'd just decided to head towards the trees, and suddenly, I was there. Each tree that had seemed so fruitful and green from a distance, now appeared close to death, completely rid of leaves. There was nothing resembling life inside the forest either, just shadows cast from the thick branches blocking out the sun. That's when I realized something about my lost personality. I was hopelessly afraid of the dark. My instinct told me to back away and leave, head in the absolute opposite direction. But there was something that existed on the other side of that forest that was pulling me ahead. The pull was stronger than my instinct, and along with curiosity, I decided to enter the forest. I made the decision and I found myself inside. There was an instant change in climate. The warmth from the sun was far gone and frost had taken over. The dead ground was hard, making each step feel like shards of glass were stabbing my souls. For a moment, I doubted my decision and looked behind, but all that existed was an endless forest. The fields had been erased from the world as soon as I made up my mind to proceed. In the darkness and silence of the forest, it seemed like time moved at a different pace. For days, I walked alone, with no memories to keep me company, with only something deep inside me to move me forwards. Every bit of emotion had been stripped from me. I felt no pain, no fear, no anger. I was just an empty shell, moving with the environment. A few flashes of what I once was, but not enough to piece together a bigger picture. Finally, something lit up at the end of the forest. A ray of sunshine penetrated the thick, intersecting branches. I felt the warmth immediately, and it freed up my joints to move faster. My pace turned into a light jog, and before I knew it, I'd entered a clearing in the woods. It wasn't a large opening, but it was full of life. Tall, white tulips sprouted up around the entirety of the clearing, with a few rocks scattered around, heated up by the sun and big enough to rest on. There was a song that broke the silence, coming from the most beautiful voice I had ever heard. Barely a whisper that could have been suffocated any other place, but not here. It was from a woman sitting on a rock at the center of the clearing. She seemed completely untouched by her harsh surroundings, the forest almost retreating from her presence, her brown hair flawlessly hanging down her neck, waving quietly in the air. 
I was struck by her presence, as if someone had punched me straight in my heart. It was such a complex array of emotion that I couldn't fully comprehend, but it made me feel somewhat at peace. It took an uncomfortably long amount of time before I realized I was staring, but she hadn't noticed me. I was surprised another person existed in that strange place and couldn't figure out how to start a conversation. Are you real? I asked, not thinking how insane that question must have sounded. She turned around and just smiled at me. The most brilliant smile I had ever seen. Hello, Devon, she said nonchalantly, completely unfazed by my presence. Devon? Was that my name? Yes, Devon. I've been waiting for quite some time now. She giggled. Here, sit with me. She gestured to the rock she was sitting on. As she leaned forward, I noticed an odd golden locket hanging down from her neck. It seemed ancient. Not being able to think what the hell was going on, I simply did as I was told. As I sat down, the forest once again became a place of life. The branches now glowing green as the sunlight hit the leaves. I felt comfortable and familiar with that place, but couldn't recall anything factual about it. There were so many questions I wanted to ask. She seemed to have some answers and some knowledge of who I was. I didn't know what to ask at first, and in a hopeless attempt, I asked everything at once. What the hell is happening? What is this place? Who are you? Why do you know me? And why the hell don't I know myself? Even through my hail of questions, she remained perfectly calm, still smiling at me, pondering a bit at my questions. <laughs> Which one do you want me to answer first? She asked. I guess, maybe where I am, how did I get here? A question that somehow felt more important than my own identity. Well, you're in a forest, that much is for sure. That's pretty much all I know about this place, though. Hmm, so how did I get here? I don't know. And how did you get here? <laughs> I don't know. Everything she said, so matter-of-factly, clearly not being bothered by our peculiar situation. So, none of this bothers you? Strange place where nothing can be explained, I blurted out. <sighs> I guess it doesn't. Her eternal calmness both infuriated me and kept me less worried than I should have been. I thought, what could I ask her to actually learn something? Hmm, what do you know then? I asked, after a moment of thought. Oh, I know about you, Devon. She proceeded to tell me facts about myself. She told me my full name, my age, where I lived and what my profession had been. All helpful stuff, except I could not confirm whether anything she said was true or not. But as soon as she spoke the facts about my life, I could remember them. Who even are you? I'm not entirely sure. She looked confused for the first time since I'd met her, looking thoughtfully into the woods ahead. Why don't we talk more about you? There's so much I want to tell you. She started with my childhood. I grew up without a mother. She died from complications during my birth, leaving my father to raise me alone in a pile of medical debt. The only memory I had of her was a box of jewelry passed down through generations. His name was Jonathan, and alongside my mother, he had a farm. I spent my early childhood living the best life on the countryside, feeding the animals and getting a healthy appreciation for nature. It was a lonely, but happy life, at least for me. My dad suffered greatly from the loss of my mother. I was too young to see it, but he was drinking an unhealthy amount of alcohol to dull out the pain, and without my mother, the debt kept growing, and before we knew it, we were living in a small city apartment after selling the farm. <sighs> That's not exactly too joyful, I interrupted. Happiness comes and goes, but if you want a happy ending, it depends on where you want to stop the story. Hmm, 
I guess that means you should continue. If you want me to. But your story hasn't ended yet, has it? <laughs> I suppose not. Though, I suspected I might be stuck in purgatory or something. There were a lot of cats living on the streets of our new home. Having sold the farm and left all the animals behind, I felt a certain longing for a companion that wasn't human. One night I was awoken to the sound of relentless meowing. A kitten sat on the sidewalk, too young to be without its mother, but there she lay, just a few feet away on the street, apparently hit by a car. I adopted that kitten. I named her Mary, after my mother, and watched as she grew up. In a way, she became my best friend, having had little contact with other kids living so far away on a farm. It had almost become difficult to fit in as the new kid at my school. She, next, confirmed something I had believed my entire life. That my father resented me for what happened. He knew in his heart that I had no say in the matter, but feelings are illogical creatures that don't care about what is right or wrong. In any case, I never bonded with my father, and he died prematurely from liver failure. I was orphaned at the age of twelve. I have a question. She looked at me, fully aware what I would ask. How the hell can you know all of this? Does it really matter how? I noticed the sun was just about to set. She had been talking for a couple of hours at that point, and I had listened contently. She was also looking at the sun, and then back at me. Oh, there are so many things I want to tell you, Devon, but it's time for you to go now. What? Go where? Before I could ask, I was enveloped in blinding darkness, stripped of all my senses and dragged away but only for a few seconds before I, once again, woke up. I was back in my own apartment. Upon awakening, I could immediately recall who I was, and with that knowledge, the cancer headache returned stronger than ever. I instinctively reached for my bedside table. On it stood a fateful companion. A cheap bottle of Jameson whiskey. A couple of swigs of that with a couple of painkillers, and I was right as rain, at least for a while. With my tumor-riddled brain, I knew the memories I'd regained in the dream wouldn't stick. So I grabbed a piece of paper and jotted down as much as I could before cleaning myself up a bit. It had been a dream. One that felt like days, but nonetheless it was the first one I'd experienced in months, and the most vivid I could ever recall having. The face of that woman had been permanently burned into my mind, cancer or not. Her beautiful smile as she excitedly told me about my life, but how she had known things I didn't even know, that my father never loved me. The day passed quickly as I spent it in a haze of alcohol. The pain had increased and medication had little to no effect. The only solution was to reschedule my next doctor's appointment to try a different drug. Perhaps I had been on that particular one for long enough to build up a resistance. I increased the dosage of my sleeping medication to compensate. No way would pain keep me away from another peaceful slumber. Within minutes, I was out yet again, and I awoke in the green fields. My memory was wiped clean save for what the woman had told me about my childhood. This time, I moved with more conviction, and within minutes, I reached the dead forest. Knowing what awaited me on the other side, the trip seemed to go quicker. I must have been halfway through the forest before I felt the presence of another being with me. It started out as quiet electrical humming, and then the sound of labored breathing, almost mechanical in nature. I stopped dead in my tracks and looked around at my surroundings, trying to follow the breathing. It was rhythmic and constant in volume, but moved around from above me into the darkness of the forest. In between the trees there was a shadow, almost invisible in the dark, but definitely something living. The shadow was at least eight feet tall and quickly moving around behind me. I fell to the ground in a panic 
and it simply stepped right over me. It wasn't a shadow, but a ridiculously tall humanoid covered in a greasy black substance. Some of it dripped down on me as I lied on the ground, sticky and warm. I turned over on my back and saw the creature. The face was obscured by the tar, but I could see the slits where the eyes would have been. It observed me for a few seconds before being hit by a ray of sunshine. The light startled the creature and it fled into the darkness. By my estimations, I wasn't more than halfway to the clearing, but I had somehow been transported to safety. I ran into the daylight, and just like the first time, the woman was sitting on a rock, humming beautiful songs I'd never before heard. Hello, Devon, she said without even turning. I was still gasping for air after my encounter as I walked towards her. What the hell is that thing back there? What thing? The tall thing covered in tar, whatever the hell that stuff was. I tried to wipe some of the tar that had dripped on me, but I was suddenly clean. <laughs> oh, that thing, she said calmly. Yes, that thing. I haven't really seen much of it. It seems to dislike the daylight. <gasps> Don't worry, Devon. Nothing will bother us here. She gestured to the rock again, and I sat down without hesitating. If I could learn who I was, maybe I could figure out what this place was. Whenever she told me about a memory from my past, it instantly clicked in my brain. I felt as if I was back in a younger body, living a previous life. I'd become an orphan, one that was quickly adopted by a couple of lovely foster parents, but there was a surprising lack of detail regarding them. They were simply plain characters in my memory. All she told me was that they were quite old for such a purpose. It had been unlikely that they could have adopted anyone at all. They took me to a quiet home at the outskirts of town. I felt uncomfortable about the image of that place in my mind. It was a perfectly nice street, not too many children, mostly retired folks living there. The neighbour was an elderly man as well, a veteran, they told me. He had a family that frequently visited, but at some point they never showed up again, and during the passing year I noticed that the grass had grown tall and the house was dirty. Oh, stop. I don't want to hear this. Why not? I don't know, but that memory doesn't feel right. Devon, I can't choose what to tell you. It has to be an all or nothing kind of deal. Why? You don't have to bring me pain. Do you always decide what you remember? Although hesitant, she seemed to make perfect sense, and I allowed her to continue. I remember someone shouting in the middle of the night. It was coming from the neighbor's house. His family must have been staying over with their children, because I heard several voices and a child crying. It all came to a very abrupt ending when I heard four loud bangs which I was too young to realize what they were. Of course, now it was obvious that they were gunshots. After the fourth shot, I heard screaming. The old man had come back to a moment of sanity after having shot his daughter, her husband, and their children. Then a fifth shot was heard, and silence fell over the neighborhood once more. My foster parents told me, they moved away after that argument. Yeah, I was stupid enough to believe it. Oh, you experience things differently once you've grown up. She was right. When I experienced the memories for a second time in my adult mind, I could interpret the events differently, less able to block out what was truly happening around me. Don't you have any more pleasant things for me to remember? The sun had already set and I was back in my regular life. Still had to wait two days to see my doctor, just going through each day, drowning my pain with a combination of alcohol, painkillers, and sleeping pills. Each night, I would return to the green fields and walk towards the forest. The sinister creature always lurked in the trees above, never too far away, but never approaching. 
I could hear the breathing. Oh, it sounded too much like a machine. But yet, with the few glimpses I'd gotten, I knew it was something more. Whenever it got too close, a light would appear and keep it at bay, and I would reach the woman. She'd gotten to my teenage years. She told me about my first crush when I'd just started high school. Having spent most of my childhood on a desolate farm or in a quiet neighborhood, I'd become quite shy. I had no real family, so to speak, and my foster parents were from a completely different generation and likely wouldn't understand the problems of the current day youth. I didn't know who to approach, so I would sit in recess just looking at her from a distance. I wasn't very subtle because my classmates had gotten wind of what was going on and didn't hesitate to spread the rumor. She was a pretty girl, at least to 14 year old me and other teenage boys, so she quickly got word of it. I literally felt like I wanted to die. <laughs> Young, overdramatic me. Surprisingly, she wasn't appalled by the idea. <laughs> I guess some farm boy charm had been taken with me into the city. We went to the winter ball together, danced and listened to cheesy music, and that evening I shared my first kiss on the dance floor. Didn't go any further with that girl in particular, however. I was destined to be a very late bloomer. The guy who ended up telling her the rumor would always take credit for that kiss, and he would become my closest friend during high school. Harold, I think his name was. That was how it went. She would brighten my mood by telling me about a nice and cheerful memory, and then proceed to the darker secrets I never needed to know. Nothing was ever as innocent as it seemed. Even a kind act could cover a deeper, darker desire. Everyone had an ulterior motive. My foster parents only adopted me because they'd lost their own child, but I could never live up to their memory of him. My father had died from liver failure. That's the story that I'd always been told, but that wasn't the truth. When I was 16, I learned about an estranged uncle. I decided to seek him out, but he was a drunk like his brother. He told me the truth about my father's death. He'd contemplated suicide every day since my mother died. He never built up the courage because... His original plan was to take me with him when he did it. For whatever reason, he resorted to pills and alcohol instead of a gun, and it fried his liver. He quickly fell into a coma and died within a week. That's the truth that got me to drink and try an assortment of different drugs. I hadn't really tried alcohol or anything. The few friends I had were into the party scene, especially Harold, and I was eventually dragged into it myself. Oh, I don't think this story has a happy ending. I mumbled, mostly to myself. You don't know that until it's over. Somehow, I feel like it's almost at that point. <gasps> the sun is setting, Devon. A common phrase I'd grown to loathe. The pain always seemed to return the further the sun set. I just want to stay here. I don't want the pain anymore. Oh, well, you can. How? I was yet again jolted back to consciousness by something pounding inside my skull. The tumor begging me for attention as always. That combined with a nasty hangover made my morning almost unbearable. But luckily I had a meeting with my doc to change the meds. It took me a few moments in the morning to remember I didn't have a driver's license anymore. Something about being a danger if I lost consciousness on the road again. A driver was already outside, ready to take me to the hospital. Some arranged shuttle I must have agreed to, but couldn't remember. As I arrived, the nurses brought me for a scan. They would check the growth of my tumor and send the results to the doctor. I must have stayed there in a hungover state for three hours before the doctor was ready to see me. I assumed he would attempt to convince me into some experimental treatment, but I would have none of it. Honestly, Doc, I can't remember what you said last time. I'm just here for better pain meds, I said, 
as soon as I saw him. <sighs> Don't worry, Mr. Pace. It's not all bad. In fact, the tumor seems to have slowed down. We might even have the opportunity to look at some different treatment options. <sighs> that sounds good and all. But what does that mean? Weeks? Months extra? Most likely a couple of months. Thanks. But I already feel shit enough with the current treatment. I just want some stronger pills for the pain. The side effects might not change much. It's out of the question, Doc. I already can't remember most of my life. I already lost who I am. At this point, I'm just a slab of meat taking up space. So, please, just give me the damn pills. He stopped suggesting the treatment then. I had a feeling it wasn't the first time we'd had that particular discussion. But it wasn't worth it. I traveled back home with a new set of pain meds, just wanting to go back to sleep. It didn't hurt when I was in the forest with the woman. I felt like a proper person, not a wreck unable to take care of himself. Each time I slept, I would get there faster and have more time with her. She would smile as she saw me, bright green eyes that dug into my soul. I felt something resembling happiness when I was with her. Well, a vague memory of the feeling, at least. The creature in the woods would also get more daring with each time. I never got more than a couple of moments to look at it, obscured by the darkness, but there was something familiar about it. She started out every time by telling me my own memories, but the lower the sunset, the more she ventured into the lives of others, telling me their deepest secrets. I met my best friend when I was 14, and we stayed together, going on teenage adventures well into our 20s. We studied at university together, I think it was some sort of literature, English history possibly, but the details were overshadowed by something more important. Once we finished university, Harold and I would work together to cut off our excessive alcohol consumption. It was time to get into a real life and a real future. Together, we became proper adults, or as close as we ever could be. In the end, we fell out of touch. I'd moved far away to a different state. There was a reason I'd moved, but not work. Something personal. Something I couldn't remember. Why did I move? She looked at me, dumbfounded. I knew at that point not to keep asking if she didn't respond the first time. After moving, we lost contact for a couple of years. I told him he had a place to stay if he ever needed anything, but he never took me up on the offer, and I never heard from him again. What had happened was that he met a girl, she fell pregnant, but only briefly before miscarrying. It broke up their relationship, and he got back into abusing alcohol, and then some drugs. He overdosed and died the first time he tried heroin, and I never even knew what had happened. I did attempt to contact him on his old number once. It happened to be the same day he had died from an overdose. In my mind, he had lived a full life, but now, well, I knew better. Would he have lived if I'd stayed? Possibly. I knew she was being truthful, but the truth is a fickle bitch sometimes. Uh, thanks for the honesty, I guess. I can't keep secrets from you, Devon, but you knew that already. I asked her not to tell me anything more during that day, at least. We just sat in silence for a few hours watching the sun set. She looked sad. It was the first time I'd seen her express a negative emotion, and it broke my heart. What's wrong? You're dying, Devon, she said. I always knew my life outside of there was full of pain. But it was the first time I'd thought about the cancer, or even realized it existed when I was with her. <laughs> right, but aren't we all though? Well, maybe not you. I'm not entirely sure how that works. 
She didn't laugh at my sad attempt at humor. There's so much more to tell, but I'm afraid there's no time. The sun was almost set, which is usually what prompted that sentence from her. Throbbing pain beginning to set in. Yeah, the sun has almost set, but you know I'll be back tomorrow. No, you don't understand. It's different now. As she said it, she didn't look at me. But it's something behind me. What? A shadow had appeared. The sun had set, but I still remained in that place. The rhythmic sound of breathing was approaching. A single drop of that nasty black substance dropped on my shoulder. I gasped for air as I was brought back into my miserable reality. It was a violent awakening. I attempted to sit up in bed, but somehow managed to roll myself onto the floor. I couldn't feel the right side of my body at all, arm and leg completely paralyzed. Panicking, I tried to passively move them with my functioning half. Pointless. My vision was blurred, as if something had gotten stuck on my retina. I was certain I would die right there on the floor of my bedroom, but the body has a funny way of surviving even the worst injuries. It had taken over from my failing mind. On autopilot, I started limping out into the hallway of my apartment complex, over to my neighbor's door. He was retired and mostly bound to his recliner with his cat, so I knew he'd most likely be home. As I knocked with my functioning arm, my body finally gave out and I fell unconscious onto the ground. I was out. The instant I hit the ground, I woke up in hospital bed. It felt like no time had elapsed in between the two events. I still couldn't move my arm or my leg. I wanted to call out for help, but my mouth was sealed shut and a tube was stuck down my throat as a ventilator was attached to me. It made a repetitive mechanical sound as the machine was breathing for me. God, was I really that sick? A doctor eventually came into the room, not one I recognized, much younger than my usual doc. He saw me struggling with a tube down my throat, and he seemed a bit happy. Don't try to speak, Mr. Pace. I'm removing the tube. Quite frankly, I didn't think you'd be able to breathe on your own. There was a certain amount of damage to your brainstem. This is actually great news. He did some tests. Shone light in my eyes and whatnot. Well, I was too exhausted from the ordeal to pay attention. He then grabbed both my hands and asked me to squeeze. I still couldn't move my right side. The doctor saw the distress in my eyes. You've suffered a stroke, Mr. Pace. Quite extensive, but we managed to fix the problem. So, with a bit of time, we'll have you back on your feet. The doctor explained the procedure and so on, giving me unnecessary details about the damage, information that well, didn't matter to me. I knew I would be dead before I could fully recover. I'm no doctor, but even I know strokes take years to deal with. I spent the day staring at the wall, waiting to fall asleep. Throat was sore from the tube they'd shoved down there, and the functional side of my body ached while the other was just in the way. I was unnaturally tired from the ordeal, despite having been unconscious for most of it. Something inside me wouldn't let me just drift off back to sleep. The lack of alcohol might have been a factor, but there was a severe lack of drinks available at that hospital. Uh, at least I had the room to myself, some peace and quiet. It was supposed to be a two-person room, but the bed next to me had recently been vacated. The sheets were still not made. Darkness lurked into the room as night fell. The busy hallways outside calmed down as only a skeleton crew remained to keep everyone alive throughout the night. The paralyzed side of my body started to emit a strange tingling sensation, and my headache was turning dull. My vision hadn't yet fully recovered, but I noticed the darkness wasn't just because it was night. Hmm. 
something was obscuring my vision, and gradually I started to fall unconscious again. Just before I went out, I saw the tall creature lying in the empty bed next to me, lifeless. Suddenly, I was in a void of emptiness. No emotion, no peace, no light. I didn't even exist as far as I was concerned. I was just in a state of nothing, and I didn't care. If I were able to describe the time I spent in that void, it would feel like millennia, but it could also have been a second. During this time, I learned nothing, but didn't lose anything. I was back in the field, the same field I'd crossed a thousand times before. I instantly recognized it, but yet everything had changed. The field had fallen barren since last time, now covered by lifeless tundra. Freezing beneath my feet, with a grey sky hovering above, barely illuminating the ground ahead. My first thought was to run, try to reach the clearing and figure out what was wrong. But I felt even weaker there. Sure enough, my arm and leg worked again, but at a much lower capacity. My whole body was failing. The forest was still there. Trees were dead and the cold exaggerated. I had to traverse it barefoot, but my knees were too weak to keep me up. I fell on all fours after a couple of miles, slowly crawling forward, fearing that I wouldn't be strong enough to make it there again. After all these times visiting the clearing, I felt like each tree was a long-time friend, each one guiding me to my destination. Even the creature that had stalked me would have been a welcome sight, but it too was long gone. I knew when I was getting close, everything was so familiar, but something was still very different, unknown and most of all, terrifying. Before I realized what was wrong, I met a wall. A cliff set in the middle of the forest, never before seen but ancient. It was a massive mountain that extended into the sky above and spread until the horizon on each side. Having no other choice, I followed the mountain wall. It was easier to walk when I could lean against the mountain. It was oddly warm, almost comforting. Soon I stumbled across an imperfection in the mountain, a dent that bent inward, leading to a small cover, and eventually a cave. The cave was the way through the mountain. It was a gut feeling I couldn't explain, but I knew with absolute certainty it would take me to her, and I had to see her, even if it was only one more time. As I stepped into the cave, I was immediately enveloped in impossible darkness. The light never faded away, but rather cut off like someone had flipped a switch. It was unnaturally warm too. The mountain wall had radiated heat, but now I could feel the warm air on my skin, almost pulsating through the cave. The warm comfort quickly turned to a humid nightmare as I progressed further into the darkness. Depending on how much the cave curved, I knew it couldn't be further than a few hundred feet to the other side, unless the clearing had been taken over by the mountain too. After a couple of hundred feet going straight ahead, I still couldn't see an opening. In the pitch dark, I bent into my fear and returned back to what I believed was the cave entrance, but it was nowhere to be seen. Even if it was dark, I knew the cave only extended in one direction with no turns. The opening had simply vanished from existence. It left me with no choice but to keep going forward, hoping it would take me outside. I walked for a few hours. The cave was narrowing. I could feel the sharp walls poke my skin. Hours turned into days. The cave was still narrowing. Days turned into weeks. Had it really been so long? Did this place not allow me to wake up? 
My sense of time had been skewed. Or did time not matter in there? My internal clock had gone into overdrive, keeping me painfully aware of each passing second. I could almost count the days, and I figured a week had passed before I collapsed to the ground for the first time. Not a drop of water, nor any food. Despite nothing being real, it wore on my body and mind. Everything felt dull. My pain was still present, but it was more like someone was pushing down on me and crushing my spirit rather than stabbing it. I thought my physical body must be dying if it hadn't already succumbed to the cancer and that my mind was trapped within its husk. Memories started flashing before my eyes, but only those the woman had told me were sharp and comprehensible. The rest were vague and incoherent. I saw a piece of clothing I didn't recognize here and there in the flashes. A laughter I could recognize but not place. But most of all was a feeling of belonging, like something had plugged that empty void in my soul. Then there was the car crash. The one that had landed me in the hospital where I got diagnosed in the first place. I heard a sound. A rhythmic beep. It was a heart monitor. Each beep feeling further away from the last. And then suddenly, it stopped. Was it mine? No. I had to know what happened. Who was missing from all these memories? The motivation alone drove me back up on my feet, and I managed to claw myself further in through the narrow caves. I decided then and there to make it to the end, no matter the cost. A dim light appeared a bit in front of me, blinding my eyes that had lived in darkness for ages, but I welcomed the pain. <laughs> it was pure ecstasy. I limped into the daylight again. It was cloudy but infinitely brighter than inside the cave. I turned around to tell the cave to get lost, because, well, I had defeated it. But it was already gone. Behind me was the dying forest that had always guided me to the clearing. The tulips had dried out, and the shiny white colour had turned grey. Most of the ground was now barren, save for a few patches of dead grass. She was sitting on the same rock as always, but her form was different. She was skinnier, almost anorexic. Her dress just a rag of its former self, dirty and beaten. I ran over to her as fast as my broken body would allow. She saw me, but remained silent. What happened to you? It's over, Devon. A part of me knew that this place only existed in my mind, and that, as my mind deteriorated, so would this. It's not your fault, she said, her voice cracking up a bit. But this place is falling apart with me. Maybe I could have saved it if I'd just taken the damn treatment. No, that's not what I mean. What, what are you... I stopped in my tracks. Her eyes stared deep into mine, and I saw a glimmer of someone familiar. My mind was back in a younger body. I was in a car driving down the highway in the evening. I couldn't decide where I was heading, and it scared me. My hands were gripping the steering wheel so tightly. In the passenger seat sat a woman, emerald green eyes wearing a golden locket. She was moving her lips, trying to tell me something, but the sound was muffled almost muted. The road ahead was about to curve. My hands were still firmly gripping the steering wheel. I was going so fast, and I wanted to turn, but my hands were frozen in place, my whole body refusing to respond to my will. My muscles started to twitch uncontrollably, and I quickly blacked out, but I knew the car had gone off the road. I knew the passenger didn't make it. I had killed my wife. It wasn't your fault, Devon. Amanda. It all clicked. 
Every hole in my memories had suddenly been patched by one constant. I moved to be with her, to start a life together. We had a great house and an even better life. Twenty years came back in a single moment. And it was overwhelming. The sky had darkened by then. The sun was still obscured by clouds. But I knew our time had almost come to say goodbye. And this place would die along with me. I can't believe I forgot you. You never did. I was always here. She paused to gather herself, both of us on the verge of tears. Oh, there are so many things I want to tell you, but there's no time, I know. I reached out for her, her arms extended towards mine. I was awake again, back in the hospital. I had died, but they brought me back after seven minutes without a heartbeat. I should have died. They should have let me go and be at peace. They patched me up and I went home. Whatever I write down, I'll leave for my lawyer to do with as he pleases, as long as none of the stories are lost. I'm sorry, Amanda. I love you. Thank you, my dear friends, for sharing nearly an hour of your time with me this evening. Oof, passed pretty quickly, didn't it? Well, what did you think of that one? Very intriguing story indeed. Well, that's it for me for one evening. I've kept you busy for too long. Go on, go out there and enjoy yourself. But, of course, I will be back again on Wednesday, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all join me once more. But for now, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>